everybody. Welcome to English 251 um, Criticism. Uh, my name is Norm Clausen, and uh, I'm looking forward to being with you for the coming weeks. I hope that this is an enjoyable experience for you. I hope that you've had a good uh, Christmas break and that you've been able to get some rest and refresh. My uh, youngest son is in his last year at uh, U of T and uh, he was able to come home for a little while. We have uh, we have the ability to sort of separate off part of our house and so he was able to have his own space and his own loo and we would just drop meals off <laughs> at, at the back door for, for him. Uh, and he found that uh, very uh, relaxing and refreshing to be able to just be somewhere different for a while. So I hope that you too have uh, been able to be refreshed in various ways over the over the Christmas holidays. Um, <clears throat> in a moment, I'm going to uh, turn to uh, my um, PowerPoint presentation, and uh, when I do that, uh, I, I lose access to the to this uh, this video part. And um, so just before I do that, I thought that I would uh, explain to you what I'm sitting in front of. Uh, in behind me is uh, a picture by Peter Bruegel, who was a 16th century painter. And uh, uh, this painting is called the Tower of Babel. And the Tower of Babel is, is uh, from the Hebrew scriptures, a story meant to explain the beginnings of language. And uh, <clears throat> it is a famous story for kind of introducing that theme. And uh, so this is what, what I have here is a 9,000 plus piece of puzzle. And um, I think it turned out very well. And so I thought I would sit in front of it for at least some of these lectures. I'm in my front room and, and uh, my wife works upstairs. And I'm not sure it'll always work for me to be able to uh, uh, record here without uh, background noise, uh, but uh, I can do it now. And uh, I thought I would take advantage of this. So let me uh, switch to my uh, PowerPoint screen and uh, walk you through both uh, the course and uh, this week's readings, and we'll get this course up and running. All right. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the syllabus, uh, which is posted on Learn. And uh, then I'll say a little bit about the design of the course. And I suppose that the first thing to be said, well, apart from the welcome, is to talk a little bit about the assignments. Skipped on to brass tacks right away here. So there are a few things that I'm gonna ask you to do. Uh, one is I'm gonna ask you to uh, make journal entries. And these are really meant to be low stakes. Uh, literary theory is a difficult topic, and the readings are really bizarre. Some of you are totally going to get into them, but for everybody, they can be really intimidating and uh, and confusing. And the journals are meant to be uh, one-page entries where you uh, kind of try to talk like they talk or take some kind of a chance on interpreting what they're saying. And... Um, to enter into, to try to enter into the spirit of what they're doing. There's lots of opportunities to submit journals, way more than the four that I'm, I'm asking for. So you can choose your times. Uh, don't put them off forever because uh, even though there are, uh, I think, uh, 13 opportunities in all, um, it's easy to run out of time and, and students occasionally do. So that's one thing that I'm going to ask you to do and that's going to be worth 20%. Again, pretty low stakes. Um, um, another thing that I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to write 
an early midterm after the uh, after the fourth week, um, and this is so you will have a large portion of the course under your belt by the end of the fourth week because that opening section really covers some important ground and will get us oriented towards uh, the more important basic concepts in literary theory. And um, so um, I don't quite know how it's going to feel with, with COVID. Um, like the way courses are designed now, it, it might not feel like you're ahead of the game, but I designed this course with an early midterm so that you do feel like you had gotten something important out of the way before midterm season hits. I imagine it'll still be like that. So uh, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm encouraging you to really uh, bear down and work hard for the opening month, uh, opening weeks of this um, of, of this of this course. And then uh, after that, I'm going to ask you to do two short essays to cover the second and the third uh, parts of the course. And uh, those will be pretty um, straightforward, I think. Um, and they'll take us all the way through the three sections of the course. Um, but uh, at any rate, that is really uh, the bulk of it. There's not going to be a final exam in this course. Um, and uh, you can see on the syllabus that there's also a, a CERB component, a uh, kind of course emergency relief benefit. So that you automatically get 10 out of 10 uh, for that. And that's just because of COVID. And there's something else that I'm asking you to do, which I've listed with the assignments. Uh, there's no marks involved for this, but I'm hoping that we can get together four times during the term. I'm going to keep office hours every Wednesday night from six to seven. And on four of those weeks, I'm hoping that everybody will show up just so that we can see each other's faces and have a little chat and uh, do our bit to try to humanize this experience and remind ourselves that we're not alone with our technology. Uh, so that's, that's really it um, for the assignments. You can um, you can see them on the syllabus, and of course you can email me if you have uh, any questions. There's no journal entry uh, that's possible or that's due this this week. Um, those will start up uh, in the in the second week. Okay, so the the next thing that I want to do is to talk a little bit about how this course is designed. Uh, I th think of this as a guided reading course. Um, <clears throat> I have a manuscript uh, of my of my course uh, lecture notes, and <clears throat> I have in fact uh, submitted these uh, these notes or this this manuscript to uh, a publisher. I just heard back uh, before Christmas that they decided they didn't didn't want the, didn't want the manuscript, so I'm going to send it to another press uh, uh, in the near future. But at any rate. Uh, this is a this is a book that uh, has grown out of my teaching of this course over many years, and um, so I thought that I would take advantage of the situation with COVID and you know, give you sort of the benefit of um, my s settled thinking. And one of the things that I think that this will allow you to do is to work through the course material at your own at your own pace. I, I would encourage you to uh, keep pace with my suggestions in the syllabus and uh, indeed in the, in the manuscript, um, but you can work ahead uh, a little bit if you want, or you, know, you, can, you can put some things off. You have to keep in mind uh, uh, the due dates for assignments. But other than that, you can sort of choose your own adventure a little bit with with this course I'm also thinking that with um, with remote teaching they say that uh, there's no one-to-one -one correspondence between the time that you spend on video and what it feels like in real time um, normally there would be two and a half hours worth of lectures in a week um, I think that 
that there are going to be a lot of courses where the time that you spend on video is going to be really exhausting. So I'm deliberately planning to have, uh, I would say, less than average uh, the amount of time spent on video and more time spent um, with you doing the readings uh, that you would normally do in this course, readings that are on Learn that are in the e-reserves or that uh, I'm, I've put up already on uh, on Learn in the weeks. And uh, and then uh, those readings and then reading the parts of the course text that goes along with this course. So the if in if you in an ordinary week you have two and a half hours of lecture then you are also expected to do um, on your own time the readings that go along uh, with with any any course so um, here you do the electronic uh, readings and then the time that you would spend in class you're going to divvy up between a relatively short video and then the reading from my textbook, which is sort of like me talking in class. So that's the way that this course is structured. And um, I hope that uh, I hope that it works for you. I hope it's a little bit of a variation on the theme of your other courses and that uh, it just it changes the pace uh, and gives you a little break from from video time. But hopefully there's enough video contact contact that it doesn't feel like you're just left alone um, doing readings. Uh, there will certainly be, I think, enough interaction so that it doesn't feel like that. But, you know, maybe you'll want to give me a little bit of feedback as we go um, to see how we're doing uh, in that regard. So let's look a little bit specifically at the, um, at the weekly schedule. So this, I, I really encourage you to, um, to, to look at this carefully and, and slowly and, and really figure out what's going on. So this is a Monday. Uh, I'm a little bit late in the day. I will try in future weeks to be posting uh, my videos earlier in the day on Monday. So there will be that, that video that's available on the Monday. And that, that there will also be um, then a, a reading from the, the, the textbook, which is called Rationality is the Essence of Literary Theory. And that textbook reading will include in it um, directions to read other texts, which are the texts that are on e-reserve in Learn. So those are the, the the main components now the way that it's laid out it looks like you know video first and then you read the my book rationality is the essence of literary theory and then you go to the e-readings I, I it's laid out like that just because of the way that the 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 term is designed the way it's set up how we're you know we get things started Started on this Monday and, and then we go for the week and then change topics but I would encourage you actually to to look at these look at the weekly schedule and to uh, look at my course text and do the readings in the order that they are presented so if you start with the textbook there's a preface and then there's an introduction and then right at the end of the introduction, it tells you to go away and do a reading from the e-reserves. I think you should do that, follow that order. In other words, do the e-reserve readings before I talk about them. So after the introduction, my first chapter talks about the readings that I've assigned at the end of my introduction. This is best because you get to then encounter the readings for yourself. And that's always the way it should work in an English course. You you read the, uh, usually it's a novel or a poem or what have you. In this case, it's a, it's a little bit of what's called literary theory. Um, but it's still uh, 
a text that you want to encounter for yourself. And then you come to class and you hear what your classmates say about it. You hear what the prof says about it. And you say, well, that jives with what I was thinking or, oh, that corrects or, oh, I don't agree with that or whatever. But you've already had a chance at least to engage with the material for yourself. So the uh, long and the short of it is, is try to follow the readings as they're laid out in the textbook and you'll be, uh, and you'll be fine. Um, the other thing that you'll see in the schedule of topics is that um, I remind you of times when I want to get together. So you'll see there that uh, I've highlighted the idea, uh, the line of us getting together this Wednesday night from six to seven, just to have a little, um, just to have a little meet and greet. And there will be reminders of other deadlines to. Um, as you as you go so between the schedule of topics on the syllabus and the layout of the text in the course textbook uh, between those two things you should be able to manage your time in this course pretty simply um, I'm, I'm hoping it's laid out in a simple and self-explanatory way again if there are any difficulties uh, do let me know Okay, I would be pausing now to see if there are any questions at this time. Obviously, uh, that's not going to that's not going to get me anywhere. Uh, so I think I'm ready to move on to the next thing that I want to talk about, which is uh, this week's readings. So let me just see where we're at. Yeah. Okay. So this is the point at which. We move into uh, sort of the video proper that sets up the readings for the week. So this is me giving you a heads up about what's coming. In future weeks, uh, I'll be doing that without that first intro to the course bit. And again, you may want to choose to not, not watch the video until you've done the reading for yourself. Or you might just say, hey, no, this gives me a, a, a heads up of what to look for, and uh, I want that advantage, so I'm going to start with the videos. It's, it's really, um, it's uh, your decision. Okay, so uh, my book is called Rationality is the Essence of Literary Theory, and that is uh, a statement that is meant to be deliberately ambiguous. And it's meant to capture two different ideas, which I think are, are important for a ground level introduction to what's going on in literary theory. So I lay that out in the preface. And if you look on the syllabus for this week, I'm asking you to read pages in Roman numerals uh, 9 to 12. And those Roman numeral pages 9 to 12, those are the pages of the preface. So I'm asking you to read the preface, and then I'm asking you to read pages 1 to 28 of the text. Uh, that includes uh, the introduction and chapter 1. So in the preface, what I talk about is the meaning of my title. And what you should get from reading that preface is two ways of reading the above title. I'm not going to go into the details of that now. I think it's pretty self-explanatory as you read the preface. But at the very least, this is my little heads up to you that that's what you should be looking for um, in the, that's what you should be looking for in the title. Well, what the heck? I feel like, uh, I feel like this video is moving along quite quickly. So why don't I why don't I just take a little moment now to to talk about that? One way to read the title with that those three dots it's called an ellipsis is to imagine that there's a colon there that there's a stop. Rationality is rationality is what, and then you can say um, you can finish that sentence in a variety of different ways. And in the first uh, section of the course, I'm going to encourage you to say that, that rationality is male, rationality is white, rationality is repression. 
And these are all negative terms in the context in which they are put. Uh, the first theory that we're going to look at is feminism. The second one is critical race theory. The third one is Freudian psychoanalysis. And for all three of those theories and many other contemporary theories as well, rationality is a problem. Rationality or the idea of rationality covers up some kind of bias or a, pl a play for power. So rationality is problematic. And in that reading, the essence of literary theory is uncovering the various ways in which the notion of rationality is problematic. Now, the second way of reading the title is to say, okay, there's a pause, but to read it without a colon and to say, Rationality is the essence of literary theory. And this, this reading is also defensible. What I want to suggest here is that the idea of rationality needs to be teased out, and we need to think very carefully about what we mean by rationality. But at the end of the day, is rationality a cover-up? or a power play that uh, covers up self-interest, covers up um, male domination, covers up uh, white privilege, uh, is, is, is a form of repression, manifestation of repression? Or is it the case that, no, when you study literature, when you engage literature, you are doing something that is very rational. And we're doing something that is rationally meaningful. Now, I would want to be the first to defend the notion that rational, rationality needs to be redefined, that what you're doing when you're studying literature isn't at all, well, well no, wait a minute, isn't largely the same thing as what you're doing uh, when you are, say, um, running a lab experiment in a chemistry lab. I'd want to say that there are important differences between what you're doing when you're doing those two exercises. But <clears throat> are they entirely different? Maybe we misunderstand or give too much credit to what we think we're doing when we're doing science. Maybe we downplay when we're doing science the role of the imagination. When we emphasize the role of the imagination in art and literature, does that mean that we've strayed from the realm of rationality? Maybe not. This is something that we want to explore in this course. So there's a twofold way of thinking about the title, Rationality is the Essence of Literary Theory. And I introduce that topic in the preface. And then there's the introduction. And in the introduction, I want to just talk about one idea, and that is that the word rationality, what we think we mean by rationality, isn't self-evident. So I've already just been talking about this and laying out the preface and with the meaning of the two meanings of the of the title. And that idea is taken further uh, in the introduction. And I have some quotations and some citations and examples of how the idea of rationality is made problematic both in <clears throat> uh, one of the really important sources for this, for this course, uh, the readings that come from an anthology edited by uh, Julie Rivkin and Michael Ryan, um, but from other sources as well. So when you read the introduction, read for that one idea, that the notion of rationality isn't maybe as self-evident as we might think it is. And then the other thing that I'm asking you to do, oh, sorry, this other part of the introduction is, is to say, oh, well, if, uh, if rationality isn't self-evident, like, how do I even proceed then? Like, I'm, I'm thoroughly confused. Like, how is it that I'm supposed to kind of read the next sentence or the next paragraph? Or how am I supposed to carry on at university? That's a really good question if that comes to mind, because what 
theorists are saying is deeply perplexing and can be deep, deeply troubling. Um, and so I, I, I raise that issue and uh, I try to give a strategy for raising one's own self-awareness of the potential problematic nature of what theory is trying to do. Um, and, and also to suggest uh, uh, a way forward, a way for, uh, uh, a way for acknowledging the question, but carrying on uh, with, uh, with the project. One of the things that's for sure is that theory is having an effect on contemporary society. And uh, theory has been around in its present form since, and you'll see this in the courses it develops, since the late 60s. And it goes back further than that for sure, uh, but really intensifies from the late 1960s and, and onward. And it has had an effect on society ever since. And so part of the question of this course is, okay, how do I make sense of this? And how, how is this manifesting itself in society? And, and am I happy with the, the state of play? Or how do I think things could be uh, uh, a little bit different? And, and the, the course encourages you to, to think along those lines. Um, obviously, you know, just as, as a second year student, you're just learning the ropes, you're, you're figuring out what the terminology is, and you're trying to figure out what the common kind of points of reference are. Uh, and that's all, that's all important. But your own thinking uh, enters into this, and your own imagining how it could be, uh, how it could be different, and what are the strengths, uh, what are the continuing challenges. Uh, all of that is part of what's going on in in this course. It is it is relevant to, for sure. This course is relevant to the whole of your university experience in English and in the arts generally, uh, but it's also relevant to your experience uh, at uh, kind of this stage of of cultural development. Okay, um, the last thing I'll say from the introduction is that. Um, I'm just going to get rid of, I see that I'm on low battery here, but I'm pretty sure I've got time to make it through this video. Um, that theory develops around questions of language. So as we think about what rationality is, we're going to weave that into the study of language. And we'll particularly turn our attention to that in, towards the end of the course. Many introductions to literary theory start with that straight away because there was a really important text that kind of about linguistics that set up literary theory. We'll get to that in due course. Uh, I'm coming at it a slightly different way, uh, but we'll think about language as part of this course for sure. The, uh, the upshot is, is that there's hope um, and, and that theory is a good thing. It really challenges the way that we think about what literature is and it challenges to think about what rationality is it has really important things to contribute that uh, were just kind of weren't being thought about uh, before its development um, but it can lead to one really having dark thoughts about the place of rationality and uh, so theory is a good thing but so too is uh, so too is rationality. And in that section I talk about uh, about three different reasons uh, for, uh, for being hopeful. Okay, so uh, maybe what I'm going to do is I am going to pause right there and, and, and plug in just so that I can make sure that I get through the rest of this uh, without, without losing my video. So let me just pause. Okay, let me get back to my screen here and carry on with what I was doing. I, can, I see that we're almost at a half hour for this video. I don't wanna keep this, keep you much longer. I'm gonna try uh, to keep these videos uh, relatively short. Okay, so the first thing that I want, to, want you to realize is that the critique of rationality is not something 
thing that theory alone does. This is actually a running theme in literature itself and always has been. So the first thing that I want to do this week is to show you that in a variety of ways. So the first reading is uh, just a little excerpt that's the beginning of a book on the writing of, uh, of poetry. And uh, so the, 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 the excerpt is called Getting Started. And there are a couple of points from that reading that I want you to take. Uh, a notion of the effable, which goes along with the idea of art as paradox and a sacred task and, and and you'll note the way that uh, the writer says you know it's not knowledge well that sounds old so it's not, it's not knowledge does that mean it has nothing to do with rationality well, we'll see right and then we'll see that the idea of rationality itself uh, and the terminology that he introduces like knowledge and technique and there's something about practicality and banality it's just like so ordinary is that rationality is art different from rationality interesting questions get posed in that very short reading and then i'm going to ask you to read three different poems and to look at them for the ways in which some kind of notion of the rational gets tabled i mean gets put on the table and is studied uh, and looked at in uh, 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 an interesting way, in a provocative way. And you, you can see that each of these poems is asking oblique or difficult questions about the notion of rationality. Um, the first one I'm gonna suggest that the, the theme or the area that we think is so super rational is the idea of law. And, uh, and, and, and yet we come away from the poem, I think, asking, you know, well, what, what is the source of law here? And is that really right? And what's really going on here? And the second one is a poem, uh, another poem about animals, actually, uh, called Woodchucks. Uh, again, there's something that the, the speaker in the poem looks like they are a very rational person and doing a rational thing. And they seem to be proceeding in a way that you read the poem and you realize, ah, ah, ah well, that didn't work out, did it? And, um, and you realize that there's something being questioned there. I think it's fair to say that what's being questioned is a form of rationality. And then in the, in the third poem, a beautiful poem. I love this poem by Sharon Olds. I love Sharon Olds as a poet. Uh, it's called Sex Without Love. And uh, it opens with a question. Uh, it seems like the, 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 the speaker is really trying to puzzle it out, trying to make sense of something. And they can't quite make sense of it. Or do they? Uh, do they make sense of it? You get to the end of the poem, and you think, oh, yes, that's right. And you think, well, wait, wait a minute. Uh, where does that leave? Where does that leave us? Um, so that's what you're going to be looking at in the actual readings that um, are meant to be the basis for the first week. So if, if we think about just what's going on beyond this introductory stuff, at the end of the introduction in, in my book, I'm going to say, go away, read Getting Started, and read these three poems, and think about them in relation to rationality. I want you to do that. And then, after you've had a little think, pretend like you're going to class, pick up my book, read chapter one, pages uh, up to page 28, and, um, and say, oh, okay, so, okay. You do the reading for yourself, and then you read my reflections uh, on it, and then we'll, we'll carry on from there. All right, and I do think that that is everything now, uh, and let's just see if I can shut it out. I think I can. So I'm going to say goodbye to you for now. Um, I hope to see you Wednesday night, 6 o'clock. And uh, good luck with the term. I hope that this course is enjoyable for you. All right. Bye for now.